Well, good evening, everybody. And on the little thumbnail images, I recognise a lot of friends that I haven't seen for a long time. So a uh, special hello to you. Uh, very pleased to be able to uh, talk to you tonight. I hope you find it interesting. Um, this is the title, Looking Closely at Windows, What Can They Tell Us? Um, and I've got about sort of 30 slides. And I just want to talk a little bit through uh, each slide. And I've got a couple of questions at the end, which I hope might stimulate discussion either at the end of the talk or for reflection later on. Well, I might get some sort of forum up, but uh, anyway, let's see what we can do. Um, well, as Mary said, I've, I've moved to Scotland. I moved to Scotland about four years ago, and I haven't really done anything substantial on vernacular for um, a frightening number of decades. But uh, four years ago, I had a lovely um, six months sojourn in the um, Calder Valley uh, between houses. And um, my interest in vernacular was uh, rekindled. Not that it's ever gone away, but um, you know, when you're in the Calder Valley, you can't do anything but uh, get interested in the uh, wonderful buildings all around you. Um, I worked with um, David, you see him here interrogating a chicken uh, on a, um, uh, a survey for English heritage, um, or historic England by then I think, uh, on Broadbottom. This is Broadbottom Farm, the two slides um, in uh, Mythamroyd, uh, a medieval, late medieval Isle Hall. So that got me back into the swing of uh, recording and preparing reports. And um, I suppose lockdown also um, uh, impelled me to sort of start to sort of think a little bit more uh, at leisure about um, the sort of... Uh, during my time in the Calder Valley with those four months, I went for walks with David and uh, on my own, taking the usual sort of hundreds of uh, pictures. And lockdown just gave a little bit of an opportunity to look through them and see if anything struck me. Well, what struck me was... Um, windows to start with. But also, uh, as Mary mentioned, I've just produced a, an article for the Yorkshire Archaeological Journal, which did a retrospective on vernacular building recording in Yorkshire, and um, looks forward to perhaps the directions we might take in the future and some of the issues uh, around that. Uh, so I was uh, very much back in the swing of things uh, at, the end of, uh, at the end of lockdown. And as Mary said, uh, two or three things have come out uh, after a very long period of inactivity. No lack of interest, but no, not great activity. Um, so we're going to talk today about the Calder Valley. At the last meeting with Malcolm, he called it David Kant Country. And I did get permission from David to go into the valley on his patch which is very kind of him. Um, so you probably sort of fairly familiar either sort of personally or through literature with, uh, with the Calder Valley. It is, I'm calling it the home of the yeoman clothier. It's not an area with uh, large numbers of gentry houses or major gentry houses, uh, but the hillsides, the dramatic uh, Pennine uh, hillsides of the Calder Valley are dotted with a marvellous uh, range of vernacular buildings from late medieval through to the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, through to the um, proper in industrial era. So it's, uh, it's a very fruitful area for um, the study of vernacular building and, um, and windows in particular, as I hope you'll agree as we move through. Um, just in case you uh, are unaware where the Calder Valley is, it, I'm really talking about the area uh, west of Halifax, so it's in West Yorkshire, uh, and um, the Calder runs from uh, well, yeah, from Wakefield up, up the, or from from the Pennines down to Wakefield. But I'm talking about the the area of the Calder Valley uh, west of the town of Halifax. So why um, why do we think about windows? Well, I had a boss in the Royal Commission who was very fond of um, correcting me when I got too enthusiastic about any particular subject, he quoted Flaubert and it went like this. Flaubert said, anything becomes interesting if you look at it long enough. 
And that's certainly what I've done with these windows. Uh, I have found them interesting. I hope you do too. Um, so uh, uh, they do have, I think, a, a lot to tell us. For a start, they're a very obvious feature of vernacular architecture. Every house has windows. Um, and they are, there's an extraordinary variety of window forms in the Calder Valley, uh, as, as we'll see. But um, what can they tell us? What can they tell us more than that they let light into a house? Uh, are they susceptible of analysis? Do they tell us more than they're simply there to, to provide light? Now, if we look at individual houses, and especially uh, more interesting, looking at wider patterns, uh, windows can, I think, uh, reveal a lot about what's going on inside a house and provide evidence of chronological change, social differences, economic activity, and even, I will suggest later, the process of, uh, of building. Uh, and the sort of thoughts in a, in a builder's head when he was considering his new house. So those are the themes we'll explore in this talk. Now, the, the sources are sort of fairly thin, I have to admit. The sources are essentially the exteriors of houses. I haven't been inside uh, many of these houses, so it's purely from external observation what we can get, uh, backed up by a knowledge of what's going on inside the houses, but from my earlier work and from the evidence of probed inventory. So we, we know a lot about how these houses functioned internally in the 17th century from, from documentary sources. Uh, but essentially, we'd just be looking at the outside of buildings and saying, OK, um, what can they tell us? I should define my terms because I'll be using uh, some terms repetitively uh, throughout this talk. I'm going to be talking about recess mullions. If my cursor works, uh, there it is. Um, I'm talking, I'll, I'll use the term recessed or, or, or sort of double chamfered windows uh, for, for this type you see on the left hand of the screen. Um, mullions set back behind the face of the wall and when the windows are, are pretty large you'll also get what's called a king mullion. I'm sure you're very familiar with these terms but uh, I might as well uh, uh, get rid of any doubt at, at this stage. So I'll be talking about recessed, recessed splayed mullion windows and I'll also be talking about flush mullion windows. You'll see here on the upper floor of, of this building, you've got the ground floor, we've got the recessed mullions, and on the first floor, we have the flush mullions. Uh, and there's, a, there's a, uh, a theme running through this that it costs more to build that, the recessed mullion, than it does to build the flush mullion. But uh, so that's one of the themes that will run through the talk. So those are the terms. We'll see varieties uh, within this, these two basic types as we move through. So what is this talk not about? I'm not going to talk about glazing, uh, partly because I don't know anything about it. Secondly, because it's a reasonable assumption, I think, that um, most of the houses that we'll see, if not all of the houses that we'll see, were glazed. Uh, in other words, they had glass in the windows rather than shutters. Uh, that's lovely examples in the Calder Valley of uh, glazing. <coughs> um, a couple of images here from uh, Shibden Hall, um, uh, but mainly the windows would, would have been plain, plain glazed, I think. Um, I'm also not going to talk about mullion mouldings, and you'll see I've um, got a, a picture from Linda Hall's book. I think Linda might have might be listening to this talk, I think, Lorraine, but um, so I've acknowledged her, her work, her book, a wonderful book on um, uh, fixtures and fittings. And there's a diagram there of the wide variety of mullioned, mullion mouldings. But I'm not going to talk about those. Um, that's another subject, um, very interesting subject. Nor am I going to talk about the window tax. Uh, again, because I don't know much about it and because it's quite an elusive sort of subject when you try and uh, pin it to a particular building. So. Um, and with those disclaimers, let's move on. And I'm going to move chronologically through and um, divide it also by uh, social, social status. I'm going to start with um, late medieval gentry houses. There are a handful of surviving uh, substantial timber uh, buildings um, uh, in, in the Calder Valley. 
um, but very little survival of, of windows. This is New Hall at Elland, uh, late 15th century Hall and Crosswings Gentry House, minor branch of the Savile family, I think it was. Uh, and you see typical Pennine framing, heavy king posts, heavy scantling generally, decorative panels. Uh, but um, on the right hand side, you can see obviously in a timber building, you're going to have timber windows. Uh, these, I'm sure, are not uh, medieval, but you can just see a series of sort of peg holes there. And um, uh, with this oversailing tie beam, it's likely that they had a sort of um, aureole project projecting window uh, hung, from the, hung from the tie beam and supported on brackets. Um, but uh, these, these mullions are obviously uh, very late in, in date. Uh, so timber buildings, timber mullions. Not too complicated, that as an idea. Um, there's, a, there's just one yeoman house, late medieval yeoman house. This is White Hall in Ovenden, no longer with us. It was demolished, I think, back in the 60s or 70s. It was, a, it was um, one of the group of uh, Calder Valley Isled houses. And what you see here is a shot of the, the front aisle of the house. Um, it was a stone house, actually, or stone and timber framed. But um, within the stone work, uh, we have this uh, timber mullion, a uh, mullion and transom window. And I believe that that was uh, rescued and um, transferred to um, Bankfield Museum in Halifax, but uh, it's not on display. So, uh, timber frame construction went on in towns much later, it seems, than in the countryside. And um, this is a well-known building in Halifax. This is wool shops. Uh, the date of this is really quite uh, uncertain. It was, I think it's been dated to the late 16th century. However, um, on this firewall here, there's a date stone, I think, of 1670. Could this be 1670? Well, uh, it seems improbable. However, a recent uh, report for the West Yorkshire Archaeology Service uh, of a building in Lambert's Yard in Leeds, Dendro dated a timber building to, um, to 1670 or, or thereabouts. So it could be that timber framing is carrying on much later in towns. And, and this, you see that the scantling of these buildings is getting slightly uh, more attenuated. So again, um, these timber, timber buildings would have had timber mullions. Uh, again, none of, none of these is, a, is original, uh, but gives an idea of what uh, the sort of um, glaze fenestration might have been like. Some later stone houses have uh, timber mullions, uh, not many. Uh, this is a house in uh, Hipperholm, another, another house in, uh, in Hipperholm, uh, with the house body uh, window uh, being timber framed, uh, timber, timber mullion and transom, uh, with some decorative glazing, uh, I gather. I don't know the building myself, but I was uh, grateful to Chris Helm for supplying me with this image. So why um, this building? should use uh, timber mullions is a bit of a mystery. Uh, there's not a decent stone mullion in the, in the whole building. It could be that this very um, narrow course masonry meant that um, it, was, it was appropriate to use uh, timber rather than, rather than stone. Um, and there are, there are a couple of other examples and I can't now pin those down. I remember um, recording one again in Hipperhome um, back in the 70s, but I can't now, I can't now trace that. Uh, so I'd be interested to know if um, other people have got examples, either in um, Calderdale or more widely, of um, timber mullion windows in later, in, in stone houses. Uh, but I think it's, they're, they're very rare in, um, in Calderdale, and the reasons for their use are not entirely clear. So let's move into the um, rebuilding period, the stone rebuilding period, which started in the Calder Valley 
um, in the 1570s, 1580s, and then just moves through uh, the subsequent centuries. The 17th century is the one we'll be focusing on uh, throughout this talk, um, or the main part of this talk. Well, there's no need to invent a new type of mullion for this rebuilding. Uh, churches and great houses had um, always had um, stone, stone mullion windows, so the form uh, and the technique would be familiar to local masons. Uh, but what the Calder Valley has is a great variety of forms of, uh, of, of mullion windows, uh, recessed, flush, as we mentioned, uh, with the different sort of types of moulding, splayed, cavetto, cyber, uh, and there are a number of different decorative types. You see here, there's a, a stepped window, got to call that a stepped window, uh, windows with uh, round arched heads, um, transom windows, uh, and a little OG, uh, OG headed window uh, here. So um, we'll, we'll see even greater variety as we move through. Um, so the assumption that I'm going to make during this talk is that windows which required greater masonry work were more expensive, uh, and we've got to consider the balance of factors which determined uh, the appearance of houses, uh, and those factors can include the uses of rooms internally, the cost of the masonry, the image which the builder wished to present to his, his neighbours, and also what sort of considerations of aesthetics and design came into play. So as I say, the um, the discussion will be based just on the ex external appearance of the buildings underpinned by knowledge from sources like uh, probate inventories or the, how the house is working inside so let's start with 17th century gentry houses the calder valley was not a center of great estates but it's rather an area where relatively modest middling or modestly prosperous uh, gentry, quite a number of them newly entering those ranks, uh, flourished alongside their yeoman clothier neighbours. There's some, some excellent examples of uh, minor gentry houses, and we'll see some of them in the next few slides. But a remarkable feature of um, some of the houses is the, uh, the round window, variously termed rose, wheel, teardrop, and so on. Um, they're not confined to West Yorkshire, and they're not confined to Calderdale, but Calderdale has the densest cluster. I think there are about a dozen. Um, I've got the reference there to um, Arnold Pacey's work, a little publication like this. I don't know whether you can see it. It's very interesting, very well worth getting, and you can write to Arnold uh, at 8 North Street. Adding, I think he's still a, a member of the group. Um, and he will he will send you a copy uh, for a nominal sum. Uh, and so Arnold's done the, the best uh, study of these of these uh, round windows. Um, so what are they for? Well, we can't say that they're functional. Um, they light tiny little chambers over the porch. They are just a, a conspicuous display feature. Got the money, we'll do it. Um, the date range is from the 1590s through to the 1670s. Um, but where do they get the ideas from? <clears throat> this is where Arnold has done uh, very interesting work. Um, he's also sort of used Marc Giroir's uh, suggestion that they are there's a connection to the um, Elizabeth Market, Smithson. Uh, for the design of um, Heath School in, in Halifax, there's a connection there, uh, and perhaps having an exemplar in the centre of Halifax uh, gave the idea for um, later uh, replicas uh, in, the, in the gentry houses of the area. They, the sort of thing that Arnold talks about, uh, and Giroir talks about, uh, are that the Elizabethan love of the, of the device or the conceit and some of these, um, you know, the, the, these round windows and the different forms that the openings take may have uh, symbolic significance. Um, but it's also quite clear 
that there's quite a tightly knit group of well-educated, sometimes university educated uh, gentry, and there may be a spirit of emulation in the area. Um, uh, um, John mogadroy has got one. I'm going to have one too at my house. Um, there are about five or six in the um, in the in the Halifax area in the Calder Valley. So moving on, but still with gentry houses. Um, the open hall was retained in um, minor gentry houses, um, not uniformly, but uh, there's quite a significant group of 17th century gentry houses, some of them doubtless rebuildings of medieval houses, where the open hall was either uh, built from new or retained from that earlier building. And we see two examples here. Uh, on the left is uh, Howroyd in Barker's Land with a, a large uh, Mullion and Transomed window, and uh, on the right, um, for me, partially obscured by uh, images of um, some of the um, viewers, so I'm not sure whether you're getting it, but um, on the right is uh, Wood Lane Hall of 1649 in, in Sarby, uh, which is a triple decker. So that window is really telling you a lot about what's going on inside. This is the this is, if you like, the ceremonial centre of the of the house. Um, and not the, the the open hall can't be considered a sort of comfortable room. It's a room that the gentry show off with or in. Um, on the left hand side, you've got the plaster ceiling and the gallery uh, at the open hall in uh, Wood Lane Hall, and on the right you have the plaster overmantel in the open hall at New Hall at Elland. The plaster is dated 1670, which shows you yeah, quite how late uh, this feature of gentry houses uh, can be. Uh, so clearly this, this is, this is the, the room where, um, if you like, ceremony is, is, a, is a term which has been applied uh, by Roger Leach and others to um, urban um, merchant houses which have a, an open hall uh, but we can we can borrow the term ceremonial open hall this is this is a, a public room if you like uh, rather than a cozy private room and the nature of that room is revealed by the um, by the either transomed or double transomed uh, window lighting the lighting the hall But not all the gentry either retained or built in the 17th century an open a house with an open hall. This is Barkersland Hall built by the Gledhill family in 1638. Uh, what's happening in the gentry houses at this time is that um, there's considerable increase in the... Um, can, can everybody... Can everybody see the whole slide? Because I, I can't see it because I've got um, four images on the right hand side obscuring the, the right hand end of, uh, of uh, Barker's Land Hall. Yes, uh, yes, Colin, we can see it. You can, okay. It's just, yeah. just me that can't see it, but I, I know the house, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so what's happening in the gentry house There's many more sort of private rooms, there's more comfort, there's more heated rooms uh, and more specialization in function. Um, and um, at Barker's Land Hall, we're getting a complete array of mullion and transom windows, uh, both in the, uh, the hall range in the centre and, uh, and in the two wings, um, with the projecting wing on the, uh, the right-hand side. And of course, we get the uh, um, three-storey porch with its, with its round window. Uh, so, um, there, there's considerable sophistication in the internal use uh, of, of the rooms with heated parlours, heated chambers uh, and um, dining rooms developing as well because cooking is moving out from the hall to special purpose kitchens at the rear of the house. But I do have a sort of query about this house. I think it's all for show really because I can't believe that the Gledhill household in 1638 was so large that important members of the family lived on the top floor and therefore their status merited 
um, transom windows. I think we're getting here the uh, idea more of uh, design and aesthetics. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a vernacular canon involved here. You still got the tripartite arrangement uh, of uh, lower end, uh, central hall range and an upper wing. So that's very much in the vernacular tradition. Uh, but you're getting a uniform elevation in terms of the uh, in terms of the fenestration, and of course it's the more expensive window type. So he's really just showing off um, that you know he's got the money. This guy Gladil's uh, got the money. Um, <clears throat> so I think there's a there's probably a. So I think that I, I would say here that uh, this is an announcement of status and um, the the triumph of um, aesthetics over the mere functionality. So we've dusted off the gentry, and now we move down a scale to the uh, to the yeomanry. And uh, I'm making an assumption that um, large, large numbers, if not all the houses we'll see, uh, 17th century houses, were the houses built by clothiers. Uh, the textile industry is the thing that uh, gives people the, the, the money in um, the 17th century in this area. Uh, we know that from inventories. Uh, can't apply it to, in, a, in a totally blanket way. Uh, but um, you know, it's, it's, these houses were essentially built on the wealth from the textile industry. And at the top end of the yeoman scale, we get quite an extraordinary uh, range of uh, fenestration. These are two houses, I think about 100 yards apart in Norland, a sort of upland township just west, southwest of um, Halifax. Uh, almost entirely with mullioned and transom windows. Um, and um, there's just one, two exceptions, or one exception in each house. You'll, you'll notice that the exception is at the ground floor lower end, where there's not a transom, there's a recessed mullion window, but not a transom. And the same with, my cursor won't work, but you'll see the same applies at lower old hall. Now, I, I think that um, it's unlikely that these yeomen had such sophisticated uses of the chambers in particular that demanded, the, all, all the chambers at least, that demanded um, this sort of extravagant fenestration. So again, I'm suggesting there's more, there, there may be emulation, you know, the gentry are doing it, I'm going to do it too. Um, and there's a, there's a real sort of um, impression of, of design considerations coming in. They're, they're, um, they're moving away from if you like, the purely functional uh, arrangement of elements in, in fenestration towards some consideration of, you know, what the elevation is going to look like. So that's the top end of our yeoman. And then we move slightly lower, lower down the scale. Uh, there's a huge variety of um, uh, yeoman houses in the 17th century in the Calderdale, in the Calderdale area. Uh, from, um, from large houses through different gradations of Paul and Cross Wing, uh, three cell, two cell, and so on, um, <coughs> and a, a similar sort of variety in, um, in fenestration. Uh, but the, these smaller houses were simpler in form than the ones we've just seen. Uh, there's less specialization in room use. Parlors continue to be multi purpose. Um, very little evidence uh, by the late 17th century of dining parlours. Uh, uh, parlours were still uh, often the, 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 uh, the, best, the best bedrooms as well as combining other uses. Uh, and cooking was still in the house body rather than in the kitchen, in, in the main. There'll be some exceptions as we move through and see. But um, despite moving down the scale, there's still great variety in window forms. Uh, we have uh, here, um, long ranges of recessed splayed mullion windows with king, with king mullions, you'll see, uh, and um, transom windows as well. Little arch-like window there over the passage. So let's have a look at a little bit more detail. Just um, at a very basic level, 
the elevation of these houses uh, shows the, the hierarchy of rooms uh, within. Uh, this is uh, Bent Head up in Heptonstall. Um, and three cell linear plan, which is very familiar in the area, and probably uh, much more widely as well. Uh, half passage plan, you can see the chimney stack there and the passage running behind the chimney stack. But the, the three cells made up of a, a lower end, um, can't really see the fenestration there, but I think it might be just um, a two light window. Uh, this is the house body area uh, with uh, a three light fire window. Fire windows are more commonly uh, two light, but um, here we've got three. Oh, where's my cursor gone? Here it is. Um, a six light window for the house body, a five light window, if I'm right, uh, for the parlor showing that the house body is certainly the biggest room, also the most important room in the house. Uh, so there's basic division uh, by uh, window size in terms of the importance of the rooms internally. Still with, um, with Bent Head, we can use Bent Head to illustrate um, two different basic forms. One is the recessed mullion window and one is the flush mullion window. Here's a, here's a detail. So the best rooms are on the ground floor and they have recessed mullions. The first floor chambers uniformly have flush mullions. Um, why? Um, it's likely that if I'm right there's an assumption of cost. This guy, whoever he is, could afford to show off down here, but not many people you know, use the upstairs. Uh, the, the rooms aren't important. They're much less significant in terms of the working of the house. And he's saving a bit of money uh, by uh, using flush mullions, uh, cheaper, cheaper to, to construct for the mason. Here's another house at uh, Midgley. Um, you can't see it all. You've got the door to the half passage, and um, there's the, the stack, the fire window, house body, parlour wing. I put this one on um, to indicate differences be between the status of, uh, of chambers. Now on the ground floor, you've got the two light fire window, probably a five or six light window light in the main body of the house, main part of the house body. Uh, a um, probably six light window light in the parlour, uh, recessed mullions, and, but also a recessed mullion on the uh, parlour chamber, but not over the house body. I think we probably, anybody who's recorded houses with, with fire hoods understands that if you've got a fire hood, you have an unheated chamber over. Uh, if you've got a, a stone chimney stack heating your parlour, you can easily uh, have a, a fireplace in your in your chamber. So this so the the parlour chamber becomes the best of the first floor rooms. The house body chamber uh, is unheated, uncomfortable, uh, and inventories show it's poorly furnished, often used for storage, um, and so. It's just got a, a flush, it's got flush mullion windows. There's also a contrast between front and back of houses. This is um, a great house at Colden, again in Heptonstall, I think it is. Um, Multi-phase, or at least, at, least, um, at least two phases, um, as shown by the, by the windows. Um, You've got a display front here uh, with complete elevation apart from the house body chamber uh, having recessed mullion windows and in two parts of the house the central range and the uh, east wing having round-headed lights to the uh, ground floor um, and uh, just the house body chamber again um, because we have a fire hood yeah, an unheated uh, chamber uh, over, and it merits only a uh, uh, the, the, the flush mullion. But essentially, this is a, this is the display elevation. 
if we move around to the back, each phase, I'm not quite sure how many phases we've got here, certainly two, possibly three uh, in, in, the, in the main bit, you, you will see that all the windows in each phase have uh, flush mullions. So there's a, a real contrast between front and back. Um, there's a display elevation where the money is being spent, and there is a um, sort of um, Marianne elevation uh, at the back uh, where there's the saving a bit of money. <clears throat> so the best rooms are at the front of the house and service rooms to the rear. Oh, here's a detail. Um, I, when I was with the Royal Commission on English Heritage, I had the use of photographers who could straighten up my photographs so that my houses didn't all fall down. Um, uh, I don't have that anymore, I'm afraid, so um, I have to live with some converging verticals. Uh, but um, here you see the uh, difference in a bit more detail, uh, recessed mullions on the display elevation and plush mullions uh, for service rooms at the rear. We're also getting differences side to side. This is a house uh, very near to the one we've just seen um, at Colden. Fairly conventional plan, doorway into a passage behind the stack, the fire window, house body with recessed um, mullions and, uh, and a king mullion, and a parlour window. Again, the house body is more important than the parlour. Um, flush mullions on the on the first floor. Below the passage, just these two, these two windows. Now we know from inventories, we can't, you can't apply it in a, in a blanket way, uh, but we know from inventories that the lower end um, in this area was conventionally, was, was commonly a shop, a textile workshop. Um, and um, uh, I think the contrast is, is very clear in the way the lower end is uh, re receives a different treatment in its in its fenestration. You see it more clearly here at this house at Colden. Just two small, two light windows, uh, and this is another house. This is a house in Worley. Three light window for the um, for the fire window, doorway to the hearth passage, and not an easy photograph to see. But you you had two two light windows here later joined. Uh, to make a, a, a continuous run of fenestration. So you're getting shop ends which are poorly lit. <coughs> and this is perhaps most clearly seen at uh, the wonderful Peel House in Worley, um, 1598, built by the Wade family, um, which I believe were clothiers. I think we can uh, demonstrate that from documents. Um, but there is a real contrast uh, on this uh, uh, this house between um, a, a very assertive fenestration in the living area uh, with round-headed round uh, lights uh, to, the, to the house body uh, and to the parlour, the parlour chamber and to the house body chamber. But the lower end, the shop end, um, has uh, just these rather uh, plain flush mullion windows. Now, Sometimes it could be argued uh, that oh the shop's built at a different time, um, but I'm pretty sure. And if we go back to the previous one, there's no there's no break in the in the masonry. I think this is all this is all one build. Same with this one, uh, and I think the same as it, it's just more uh, dramatically expressed at Peel House, where you've got uh, really good quality ashlar on the living part and rather poorer uh, thin coarse masonry in, in the shop end. So this is the, um, this is the uh, a demonstration that um, the, the owner is saying, you know, this is the part where I live here, and this is where I make my money. Um, I, I'm not sure, even, even though these are the sh the shops are revealed by the inventories, I don't think that these are, and, and they certainly did contain looms, but I can't see the owner of this house 
spending his uh, time on his own um, making up cloth. Um, he would probably employ outworkers. We know this from other cases where um, they're, they're basically master manufacturers. They're coordinating manufacturers. And I, my, my hunch is that whereas he might have worked part time at a loom in this poorly lit uh, shop, uh, the shop ends were mainly used for storage of um, of textile textile goods, either raw materials or yarn, or quantities of uh, of cloth of different types. And we certainly see that in the in the probate inventories. But when we say weavers' cottages, we think of rather later. Uh, period and especially in the, the Huddersfield area where you do get extraordinary ranges of um, first floor windows for, for loom shops. This is a house in Albanbury and this is the um, Con Valley uh, Museum uh, in Golka uh, with um, reconstructed or, 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 or equipped as a, as a loom shop. Uh, gives you a good idea but you know, by, by the late 18th century they are building purpose-built weavers cottages uh, and I think probably in some ways that might help to confirm what I'm suggesting here that the, these are not great weaving shops the weaving went on in um, outworkers houses um, rather rather than in the the shop of the master manufacturer so that's what a weavers cottage looks like um, 100 years later, 150 years later. So let's move on and think about the design process. Um, we might not ask ourselves the simple question, who actually designed the buildings? Uh, to what extent was there a conscious design process? And how did that process, and if there was, how did that process work? The problem is we don't really know a great deal about um, the role of the mason. We know that the masons obviously built the houses, but the relationship between, <coughs> excuse me, the relationship between the mason and the builder, that is to say the owner of the house, is very unclear, um, very poorly documented. Um, David Kant has produced, you see a little reference there at the bottom of your screen, to an article um, 17 years ago in Yorkshire Buildings. He's pulled together evidence uh, of, um, of masons in the Calder Valley and uh, rather more broadly. Um, but he would be the first to say it doesn't amount to a great deal. Uh, the very poorly, this, this aspect of um, house building is very poorly uh, understood, very poorly documented. Were there pattern books? Well, um, I don't know one. Does anybody? You'll tell me perhaps at the end. Or once we get a few uh, houses uh, built in the area, a new, uh, an aspiring yeoman say, well, I like his. I'll have one of those. Um, just sort of emulation or just um, following and and and, and you know, what what did the mason actually offer well we're now going to move into uncharted so this is a relatively simple house here and it, it, the, the, the builder and the mason might have come together and said okay we'll give you we'll give you recess mullions on your ground floor your best rooms uh, flush mullions at the top those less important rooms a couple of flush mullions in, in the shop end, um, uh, just like the guy up the road. Um, yeah, that'll, that'll do. We'll have one of those. What happens when we get slightly more complicated? Now here, I'm going to risk a little bit of drama documentary. I'm going to introduce you to, um, firstly, Thomas Crabtree. Thomas Crabtree owns Birch and Lee Carr at Wadsworth. So if you got that, I'm Thomas Crabtree. He's got a wife, Elizabeth. 
and we're going to meet Mason. He's called he's called William Mason. Okay, so that's the scenario. I've introduced you to the characters. Hope you enjoy this. Right then, it goes like this. Got a house here at Birch and Lee Carr with a much more complex design than we saw at Hippins, the pre previous slide. So, Thomas Crabtree comes along with a drawing produced by William Mason, the Mason. He says to his wife, here, he's done us a right good drawing here. I think I'll go with it. What do you think, Elizabeth? Well, I hope he can build better than he can draw, is all I can say. But, you know, Thomas, it just won't do. It just won't do. It's all right for you. You're getting about mowers all the time, bullying your weavers and spinners, or you down market, nattering to your mates. I'm stuck in house body all day, every day, looking at the bairns cooking for thee. I want a better house body. I want a blooming transom in my house body. Oh, do you? No, oh, oh, oh. oh, sorry. Oh, do you? I'll, I'll talk to Mason then. And whilst you're at it, I think, I think I'm going to move best bed upstairs to parlour chamber. It's the coming thing. Gentry are doing it. I think we should show the way. So we, we don't want just an ordinary window up there. Let's have a stepped one like them Briggs has got at Oldsworth. Oh. Oh, you really want that? Ah, you go and see Mason tomorrow. Mason, this drawing, it won't do, you know. We're not having it. Wives have been getting at you, has she? No, 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 no. But anyway, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, 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 a transom window in house body, and we're going to have a step window in parlour chamber. Well, I can do that. It'll cost you though. I know. Right, that's it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, very flippant, silly way of illustrating how designs might might come about. Um, to me, you might think that um, in, that the builder might have said, well, we, we, we've got a we've got a transom window in the house body. Well, let's have one in the parlour. Um, and um, yeah, so so yeah, just quite can can what we see in elevations tell us something about how the decisions were reached about um, how to how to how to glaze our houses so there i hope you enjoyed that oh i had a little quote for you as well this is from gervais markham who wrote in 1615 the english housewife and the quote is the perfect husbandman's office and employments are ever for the most part abroad or removed from the house, as in the field or yard, while the office of our English housewife hath her most general employments within the house. And that seems to me to just express a nice um, difference and, and a nice way in which uh, the uses of houses and, and, the, and the use made of houses by the occupants might have influenced uh, the, uh, the design process. I'm not saying that um, that scenario is anything like the way decisions are made in my house, I have to say. <laughs> or perhaps a little bit. Right then, <laughs> let's move on quickly. Um,
by the late 17th century, we're getting different types of house. We're also introducing different types of window. Um, you'll see on the left-hand side, Scout Hall uh, in North Aram, 1680, uh, Gentry House, uh, entirely with um, cross windows, new form of, of cross windows. Now we see that in a number of other houses. So they moved away from the long ranges. So instead of getting sort of the horizontal, we're now emphasizing the, the vertical. Uh, but still at Scout, Scout Hall, you've still got a basic tripartite arrangement of the, of the elements. So with an off-center doorway here, uh, a central house body area and, and parlors either end. Uh, but the, the elevation, we moving towards sym symmetry, didn't quite manage it uh, because of the way the, um, the, the internal rooms are disposed. Uh, and then by the early 18th century, we um, start to see sash windows appearing. Um, there's one at um, uh, Coley, Coley Hall at Hip Home, probably 1730, something like that. Uh, this is um, a later house, uh, white windows at Sowerby, uh, a car house of the 1760s uh, with, uh, with sash windows. So we're getting more choice and also more differentiation between uh, social levels. Um, uh, the bigger houses, the gentry houses, moving more towards these upright windows. At a, a lesser level, we uh, are seeing um, developments uh, moving away from the tripartite house of lower end house body uh, parlor uh, to a double fronted house with a, with a, a central or off center uh, entrance. Um, and we've got here house, two houses of probably fairly similar date. Uh, I think probably 1720, 1730. Um, similar date, similar basic form. Um, central entry with a little pedimented door case in, in both cases. Uh, but Eastwood Old Hall is traditional in its uh, fenestration with recessed mullion windows, uh, King Mullion. Um, but Longfield House in Hampton Store uh, has adopted the cross window. Um, so what's the... What's the, what's the basis for the decision making here? It might be something to do with location. This guy high up on the hill, probably not expecting to get any passers by and nobody to impress. Uh, the builder of this house um, lived in, in the village of Hepton Stall. It's right by the, the road. Uh, and it was, it was on display much more. So perhaps he thought, well, let's uh, show off a little by uh, introducing new forms of fenestration. Uh, and perhaps it's also to do with his own perception of his uh, his status. Uh, it might have been, we don't know. We don't know what this um, what this builder did. Whether he's um, got an industrial profession or or, or, or some profession like um, surgeon or um, solicitor. Uh, but anyway, the, the, there was the, there was a choice. Some people went one way. Some people went the other. I have to say that the traditional is, um, is much more common uh, as, a, as a choice. So moving towards the end of the story, by the um, second half of the 18th century, we're getting hundreds of um, uh, terraces of, uh, of cottages built. We're getting hundreds of uh, little lathe houses built. Here's a lovely little lathe house in Midgley, dated 1831. Um, and um, in these two types of buildings, the, the terrace cottages and in the, um, in the lathe houses, it's the flush square mullion which takes, uh, which is the dominant form um, uh, right, right through to the middle of the 19th century. Uh, this, this, this house here is dated 1831, but it's got the typical um, Venetian window, which you find uh, in scores and scores of um, uh, lathe houses over the over the entrance to the um, to the buyer and the barn, the lathe, I should say. Now the mullioned window never goes away, 
uh, the flush months, the recess money in the window never goes away. Uh, and indeed, um, by the time we get to a sort of vernacular revival by the mid 19th century, uh, it's, it's certainly very much still in play, although proportions are very different. This is the 1844 extension to Broadbottom at, uh, at Mytham Royd. So we're still getting the recessed uh, mullion windows, almost perhaps as a conscious revival uh, here. So we've had quite a tour. This is a proper Pennine house. There aren't many left like this, um, working working farms, um, but very characterful. You can see you know, quite a variety here. Uh, transom window, mullion window, step window, uh, transom window with king mullions, flush mullions, little oval window. So a real riot of window styles. So um, as we've seen right through. So um, we've virtually wrung the windows dry for what they might tell us. Um, you might say I've been dancing on the head of a pin whilst flogging a dead horse. Um, but uh, we've used different forms and styles of windows to probe the workings of the house in terms of room uses. We've tried to relate different styles to considerations of cost, display and the status of builders. And my dramatic reconstruction has just indicated the uh, just perhaps raised ideas of how how designs actually uh, materialized, uh, what the decision making process was in the construction of a house. So we've used tried to use a single feature common to all houses, perhaps taken for granted when we record individual houses, but when we put them together. Um, we can get a, a, a deeper understanding of why the Calder Valley houses show such variety during its period of great rebuilding. And I think our final slide. So um, those are my ideas. Questions I want to perhaps leave with you for discussion later or, um, or beyond this meeting. Can you do this anywhere else in Yorkshire? Is the Calder Valley exceptional? Uh, I don't know other areas very well. I'm conscious that um, some parts of the Dales have you know, got great variety, um, whether it's the same, whether you, can, whether you can do the same sort of thing, if it's worth it, um, in, um, in the Northern Dales, I don't know. And again, you know, if this exercise has any sort of value at all, um, is there any other feature that could bear the same sort of scrutiny, give the same sort of same sort of results? Um, externally, perhaps you, you have doorways. I'm not sure you get quite the um, suggestions from, from the doorways as you have from uh, what I've suggested with the windows. Uh, and anything internal, obviously, it becomes much more complicated because you've got to get access to, to people's houses. Uh, so those are some of the things I'll, I'll leave you with. And then finally, uh, I just want to thank all the people that have helped me put this um, uh, presentation together. David Kant, um, Chris Helm and Katie McAdam, who supplied images. Lorraine, who's uh, guided me through the Zoom procedures. And Mary, who's uh, again helped uh, settle me uh, for, uh, for giving this talk. So I'll... Stop sharing screen and hand back to Mary. <laughs>